Welcome back, everybody, to another webinar organized by Princeton University's PCF. We're very happy to have uh, Veronika Guerreri with us today from Chicago Booth. And she will talk about can supply shocks cause demand shortages? Hello, Veronika. So, like last time, I would like to go back to a previous presentation. We had the last webinar with Raj Chetty. He was talking about tracking real time impact of COVID using private data, but daily private data up to date. Today, Veronica will present about how supply shocks translate into demand shortages. And then next Monday, Philip Lane will talk about the ECB policy, about the APEP program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program. And then subsequent Friday, we have Eric Hurst talking about the US labor market during the COVID crisis, having real-time evidence from payroll data. So before, as before, I would like to look back at the classification of some shocks. And we did this once before. We said, oh, there are initial shocks, and then there's amplification through feedback loops, spirals, and other nonlinearities kicking in as risk-on, risk-off phenomena. Or then we have flight to safety, amplifying things even further. But today is the focus on the classification of the initial shock and the different ways you can classify initial shocks. One is on the time dimension, is it a temporary or permanent shock? Is it a V-type shock, U-type or L-type? Or as Paul Grubman pointed out in our webinar, a whoosh-shaped shock, like a Nike whoosh, and we come back to the old path. But today we focus very much on supply versus demand. 1970s has shown how important it is to distinguish between the two things, also with regard to inflation. Finance is distinguishing much more between aggregate and idiosyncratic shocks. But today is the finance versus demand perspective. So before doing this, let me go today already to a poll. And I have four questions today. The first one is, do we need a demand shock stimulus right now? Should we implement another demand shock stimulus? The second question is, is the COVID supply shock or might be a supply chain shock uh, is it a temporary in nature? And we will go back to the pre-COVID steady state. Uh, or will it be the case that the market forces will trigger necessary supply reallocation? So we don't really need big long run government intervention steering the economy in a particular direction. So market forces will steer it in the right way. Or do they require a huge industrial policy by the government towards green economy or other initiatives? Uh, do we need that? And it would be the second question. Um, the third question is then much more closely connected. Um, this drop in restaurant consumption, is it due to a supply shock because restaurants are shut down by regulation? Or is it due to a demand shock because people are afraid of going to restaurants? And that way it's difficult to say. It might be both might be important, or you know, the classification doesn't really matter in the first place. And the same answers you can also give for the fourth question, which is an increase in unemployment due to the decline in labor demand or labor supply. Again, nobody wants to go to work. They are afraid to work because of the um, uh, COVID uh, virus. Or is it difficult to say, or the classification is not the first order importance? So let me just um, let you vote for a little bit. Give you another, okay, the poll is closed. So do we need a demand stimulus now? The question, the answer is 71% think yes, we need it at the demand stimulus, we need it now. 29, only 29% of the people think we don't need a, a demand stimulus on top of it, what we have already seen. Uh, then the second question was, we have this COVID supply shock, is it temporary? And we will return to the pre-COVID steady state, only 15% think that. Um, what's about the market forces will trigger the necessary supply reactions, you know, fewer airlines, but more online teaching, online um, medicine or telemedicine and so forth, 55% think, but does it require industrial policy by the government, 48% think, again, you can choose more than one question, that's why this whole thing doesn't end up to 100%. About the drop in restaurant consumption, is it a supply shock because of the sh shutdown, 32% think. Uh, so 
Is it a demand shock? 62% think, and it's difficult to say, 26% think as well. The classification doesn't matter so much, it's only 10% think that. And on the labor market side, labor demand, is it a labor demand shock? Essentially, firms are not demanding labor, labor anymore. 73% think it's the labor supply because workers are afraid to work. And they don't go to work, it's only 20%. It's difficult to say it's 17%. On this classification doesn't matter, it's only 7%. So these are interesting takes uh, out of this. Uh, I'm most surprised that the people think we need another huge stimulus um, uh, going forward. Now, let me just go a little bit to the question, the rest of our demand or supply. So as I mentioned, it could be a supply shock due to a lack of, to the lock down of the restaurants or it could be demand shock because the citizens fear that, uh, you know, they might catch the virus and hence don't want to go to restaurants. I think what's important is here that uh, it matters a lot that you specify the good exactly. It's if you specify it as a meal served in a nice and safe restaurant ambiance, but then actually you, it becomes very clear that it's actually a demand phenomenon. So that's the demand exists for a nice safe restaurant where there's no virus and you can hang out with others and eat nicely together. That might be still there, but it cannot be supplied. So it's really a supply problem. And hence the price of this thing is of this nice service you would like to enjoy in a safe environment is infinity. Okay, so it's not zero and it's infinity. So the next question then is when we measure then inflation or the consumption basket, how should we reflect that essentially we have a consumption basket where the quantity is zero and the price is infinity. So we multiply essentially zero times infinity and then we have to figure out what is it. Typically, if you run traditional inflation measures, I guess what they will do, they're just assigned to it zero. So the price drops down to zero, the quantity drops down to zero, but it doesn't need to be, uh, even if there's tiny quantity out there, uh, it also should still reflect that. So the key insight I think here is that you really have to specify exactly what good you're looking at and it's a contingent good uh, where I think all the contingencies it has to be a restaurant with food and in a safe uh, environment that's essentially something which is currently priceless so the price is very very high and you know what this high price perhaps only a few people can afford it and it cannot be supplied so it's indeed in my opinion more supply shock. The other thing is what comes to my mind is that you know what's a demand shock what's a supply shock if you think about a production chain, so it's, you know, there's raw material, then there's manufacturing, different stages of manufacturing, and there's demand and supply in each stage of that. And at the end, finally, there's retailing, and then it goes to the final customer. But then the households, they are go back, and they also are essential inputs to the manufacturing. So the question is, you know, every firm in every part of this chain, you have demand and supply interacting. So it might be uh, less meaningful to differentiate the two. Now, what's the demand shock in modern macroeconomics? Uh, typically, how to we model that? One way to model this is you have preference shocks. We change the discount rate suddenly or discount factor beta changes. That affects the consumption savings decision. That's what we want. Suddenly, people become less patient. They consume more and save less or the other way around. But it also affects the labor supply shock. Typically, we focus on the first one and don't focus on, on the second component or we model a demand shock by an increase in, in, in risk. So the risk shock goes up, the probability of a shock goes up, or the size of the shocks go up, it can be idiosyncratic risk, or risk aversion against shocks is going up. So the precautionary savings demand is going up, there's less consumption, and it's again a consumption demand shock. But it also affects the portfolio choice between risky investments and less risky investments. And it has essentially two components and it's always you know, a challenge to separate the two if you want to only have the former component, not the second component. Now, finally, uh, I would like to highlight a final point, which is about the uncertainty about the length of the pandemic, which has, what are the implications on the demand side for that? And I think it's a big component. Uh, I think uh, what we see is a very nice modeling exercise, which makes very, very clear the driving force, and that's the strength of uh, the paper I think uh, Veronica will present. There's a zero probability shock, then you go in the pandemic, and then you know you're in the next period, you get out of again and go back to the steady state. And this is a very nice, clean exercise, which switches off certain effects to zoom in 
in this particular effect. The question is when you enrich the model and you make the length of the pandemic random, so that's uh, what I do with uh, Sebastian Merkel and Jonathan Payne and Yuli Sanikov, we have a model where we look at inflation, deflationary pressures. So this uncertainty might actually also affect the demand channels quite a bit. So first of all, because of this uncertainty, when the pandemic will be over, there's additional risk, which leads to additional precautionary savings demand compared to a setting where you know when the recession or the pandemic is over. And then once it's over, if it is over fairly soon, uh, you might have some additional over saving and there might be some pent up demand and other elements uh, which might then, you know, once the uncertainty lifts off, you might also get some demand boost after the vaccine is discovered. So with this, let me now leave it at where we are and pass on the floor to Veronica. We are looking forward to really see how in a particular model we see how the supply shortages can lead to demand shortages and how this whole thing is interconnected. And we're looking forward to your presentation right now. Thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot, Marcus, for the nice and interesting introduction and everybody for inviting me. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub and Ivan Werning. Um, who are all present as uh, co-panelists, so you will uh, see them later at the Q&A. Um, and we started working on this project uh, at the very beginning of uh, the pandemic in March, and the objective of the project was really start thinking about what is the right macro model to think about the pandemic. So people started using an existing model, typically representative agent model, um, simple macro textbook model to think about the pandemic and its effects and possible policy. And we started thinking what are really the ingredients that we need to think more carefully about uh, its, impl its implications and then to think about possible policy prescriptions. So what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, to explain what we believe are important uh, ingredients of a macro model to think about the pandemic. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, what are the policy takes that uh, we get from our theoretical insights. And then uh, there has been a lot of exciting work uh, and surprisingly fast work on the real data. You have seen the talk of Chatty on Monday and there's been other uh, coming up. Um, and uh, um, and so I'm going to try to go back to what evidence we have so far and try to interpret that in, uh, under the lens of our model and try to see uh, what story the evidence seems supportive of and, uh, and what are the next uh, possible uh, um, uh, investigation that we can do with the existing data to think more deeply about the mechanism at work. So, uh, unfortunately, I don't need to convince you that uh, COVID-19 had so far a large and deep uh, uh, impact on the economy and, and policymakers all around the world have been trying to think about what is the best way, the best policy to act fast and to avoid uh, a big hit for the economy by the, by the pandemic. So, this has been, uh, um, it's created as the first question in, uh, in uh, Marco's poll this morning, a lot of debate about do we need the stimulus or do we need more stimulus uh, or not? And, and so there has been a, this live, lively uh, debate about how much expansionary policy, either monetary or fiscal, we need to do in response to the pandemic. Uh, can be reframed in academic terms, in terms of the standard macro textbook model as uh, is the pandemic uh, a shock that primarily affect the aggregate supply side of the economy or a shock that primarily affect the demand side of the economy. And then we typically don't know that uh, in a standard model, if the shock is on the supply side, well then expansionary policy may not be ideal because may just generate inflation without having an impact on, on the level of activity in the economy. Otherwise, if it's a demand-driven shock, then instead the stimulus is beneficial. So the objective of, of this paper and how we started thinking about this problem is actually to kind of show you that uh, these uh, framing the debate in these uh, uh, terms of supply versus demand is a little narrow in a sense and it's a little bit uh, 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 misleading uh, because uh, what we're going to emphasize uh, is that there are important interconnection between uh, supply and demand uh, that are relevant in the, in the way the shock is transmitted to the economy. And this is going to be particularly important when we think about the pandemic shock. 
So in what sense, what, why this pandemic shock is different from other shock? And so the important ingredient that we want to emphasize that we need to bring into our macro models to think about the pandemic is multiple sectors. So in, in the past, we have already realized that the standard representative agent models, a complete market version of the representative agent model, is a model that uh, has uh, needs uh, um, extension in different direction, depending on the question. And for the Great Recession, heterogeneous agents was the interesting uh, bit that we wanted to add into the picture. For the pandemic, it, we think that the even more interesting thing that we need to add is the multiple sectors. And why? Well, because when we think about the pandemic, we think about a shock that hit the economy in an asymmetric way. So it hit the economy it hit, it hit some sectors of the economy that are more a high contact intensive, much more than other sectors. And so the question is when the shock hit the economy only on, on, in some of these uh, sectors, uh, how does it propagate to the rest of the economy if it propagates at all? And uh, uh, the, the, the way in which we are going to think about this question is uh, going to be framed in terms of a uh, of what we call a Keynesian supply shock. So what we are going to define as Keynesian supply shock is a negative supply shock that causes demand shortages in the way in which it propagates to the rest of the economy. So let me be clear right away about what do we mean by supply shock, okay? Because there may be different, I mean, a label here may mean different things to different people. So I want to be all on the same page of what we mean by that. So what do we mean by supply shock, uh, negative supply shock, is a shock that reduces what is the efficient level of production in the economy. So we, we are not taking a stand that this is necessarily a shock to productivity. It may be a shock to preferences. It may be a shock to, to productivity. It may be a lockdown. It may be that people get fear uh, about uh, uh, some sectors because there is a higher chance to get infected. Okay? In our uh, definition, this is a general way of thinking about the shock. In, whenever this is generating a drop in the efficient level of production, this is a supply shock. And when we think about demand shortages, what we are thinking about is, well, if this supply shock happened in the economy, is the production, a real level of real activity going down beyond what is efficient? That is going to be a demand shortage in our, in our framework. Okay? And so what we are going to show is that the Keynesian supply shock, so shocks that even though start as, as a negative supply shock, they actually generate demand shortages that go beyond the drop in, in activity generated by the initial shock. Uh, these type of shock are more plausible when two ingredients are in our models. Uh, first of all, when we have multiple sector, what is important, what is an important source of demand uh, factor is the degree of complementarities across sectors. Okay. And second of all, another ingredient that amplifies the demand effect of the initial shock that is, uh, turns out to be very important is the degree of incompleteness of the market. Okay. And then in the paper, we also focus on two additional ingredients that amplify this demand effect through which the shock propagate to the rest of the economy. I'm not sure I'm gonna have time at the end to talk about that. So let me just briefly preview them now. So first is the input output linkages. So in, in a sense, this is a way in which we wanna think about complementarities across sectors in a broader way. In the model I'm going to present, complementarities across sectors are going to be mainly through preferences. But what we show in the paper that is that when you have input output linkages across sectors, these complementarities may become even stronger. And so the demand effect and the, the case for the Keynesian supply shock may become even stronger. And then the additional important piece is, uh, well, what about businesses? What about when there is some endogenous exit decision of businesses? Well, we, when we introduce endogenous exit, then we show that there may be an amplification effect that generate cascades effect because of the lack of demand feeding back into more exit and so forth. So what are now the policy implications that we, uh, we learn from this theoretical uh, framework? Well, I would say that there are two important uh, um, uh, lessons that we learn. First of all, if we believe, uh, as we do, that we are in a, uh, in a world where Keynesian supply shock happens, and so where the pandemic is a, is a Keynesian supply shock, uh, 
then expansionary policy, either monetary or, or fiscal policy, are of course beneficial because there is a lag, there is a shortage in demand and anything that can help in that direction is gonna be beneficial. However, we are gonna show that in the, because of the asymmetric nature of the shock, uh, these policies, the traditional type of policies like traditional government spending and so forth are gonna be less effective than in a usual uh, framework. And, and then here comes our second lesson. The second lesson is that what is important to, uh, in any optimal policy scheme in, uh, to respond to the pandemic is uh, to provide social insurance. And, and this is what we have seen, actually, the CARES Act have been uh, doing, and, and I'm going to talk a bit about that at the end. Um, and so we believe that this is very important and very effective in responding to this type of shock. Also, uh, uh, in the paper, we kind of go a little deeper into thinking about how can we implement social insurance in the best way. And we're gonna think about the possibility of incentivizing uh, uh, labor hoarding as a way of doing that. This is kind of beneficial in two dimensions. First of all, because it provides social insurance. Second of all, because uh, it's gonna help also more during the recovery to avoid the cost of destroying oops, matches. Okay, so let me show you with a, a picture uh, our main uh, theoretical lessons. First of all, let's start with a one sector complete market version of the model, so a standard model. In that case, a Keynesian supply shock is not possible. A supply shock is a standard supply shock and demand shortages cannot go beyond the level of efficient, uh, efficient level of production. Now, how about if we introduce incomplete markets into the picture, into a one sector model? This is a, a more new result. Actually, uh, in that case, even if you're introducing complete markets, uh, still a Keynesian supply shock is not possible. So still a standard supply shock uh, preserves na nature of a, as a mainly supply driven shock, even in the way in which it propagates to the rest of the economy. And uh, uh, I'm gonna talk about the intuition of why is the case, but this is a pretty robust result independently of the way we, in which we model incomplete market. Um, now, what instead uh, it happens when we introduce multiple sectors? When we introduce multiple sectors, in, instead, even if we keep markets complete, uh, well then, occasion supply shock is possible. And then uh, we are gonna show that uh, in the case in which we embed both incomplete markets and multiple sectors, then Keynesian supply shock are even, the case for Keynesian supply shock is even stronger. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna show you in the, the bulk of, our, of my talk today. Before going into the details of the model, uh, I wanna give you a little bit of an overview of what, our, what is our study, what is the study that we wanna tell uh, in a picture. And so think about two sectors. Sector A is a high contact intensive sector, and sector B is a low contact intensive sector. There are workers who work in sector A and workers who work in sector B. They both receive income, and there may be some transfers among them, so markets are complete. This is like before the shock in normal times. And, and they spend, both workers spend in both sectors, Okay, uh, and so if there is no shock, the sectors uh, are pretty symmetric. Now, what happened when we have a pandemic? So we're going to think about the pandemic as a shutdown in trading of the goods produced in sector A. Okay, and again, this may be, broadly speaking, this may be due to uh, the fact that just the goods that are produced in sector A requires uh, some contact uh, to, to get consumed. For example, think about restaurants. And so people don't want to go to restaurants. People don't want to work in restaurants. Maybe there is a lockdown that shut down restaurants. For whatever reason, these goods is not provided. There is no trading in that good. And then workers are going to stop getting income. But if we live in a world where workers are insured against the shock, they will get transfers from workers working in sector B. And so they will be able still to consume in sector B. Now, the question is, our question is how much, because of course, sector A, there is a drop in, in production in sector A, 
um, because of the nature of sector A uh, linked to the type of shock. But the, the, re the question that we're really interested in, well, what happens to sector B that otherwise, uh, I mean, it's not uh, intrinsically like related to the, to the pandemic. So you could keep uh, consuming sector B goods, even if there is a, a, the pandemic, because this is uh, something that you can do online or things that you don't need uh, contact uh, to consume. But still, there may be effect on their demand. And so if there are transfer, if the effect on demand in sector B can go either way, depending on the complementarity of the goods produced in sector B. So we said, let's assume that A, sector A is restaurants. Uh, if you think of sector B as grocery, of course, demand for grocery when restaurants close may go up, okay, from the household or take out food. Take out food uh, may see an increase in demand. However, if you think, for example, about uh, online clothing, people may decide to buy less online clothing if they're not going out as much as before. And so this may see instead a drop in demand. Okay, so this is gonna be the one, the first important component of our model is the complementarities across good. And then uh, the second important piece of the model is the incomplete markets. So incomplete markets, as I said, if we have one sector model do not play any role, but once we have multiple sector, actually incomplete market play an important role in amplifying these demand effects. And so the, the, the thing is that now we don't have transfers between workers uh, in sector A and in sector B. So if these sector A workers don't have any income, we can think like as an extreme, they don't have any money, they cannot borrow anything. And so they are actually not gonna spend anything anymore in sector B. So now the demand in sector B is gonna see a drop due to the lack of demand from sector A workers. So even if the good produced in sector B is relatively complementary to good produced in sector A, so that the demand from sector B workers actually goes up, you may still have the total demand goes down because of the lack of demand from sector A workers. Okay. So these are the two ingredients of our story, complementarities and uh, incomplete markets. And I ho uh, hopefully now I'm gonna give you a little bit more of the intuition for the mechanism as we go farther into the model. So the plan... Uh, yes. Veronica, can I just... Uh, Heracles uh, Polymachakis would like to know, you referred initially to a, a model where there is, uh, you know, heterogeneous, many, many sectors interweaven, uh, working together in supply chains or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, it would you could be generalized, but he was wondering once you have delay in production in different stages, can you say something beyond that? Of course, it goes way beyond your model, but can you speculate whether it would apply in principle? Your analysis would apply in principle to this such a generalized setting too. Uh, so a generalized setting where you have you have delay in production because of the lack of intermediate goods that are coming in, or is oh no, it just takes various uh, several periods to come. Uh, the production stages, you know, each yeah. step I mean, takes one course, period, I mean, let's say. Yes. So, of course, I mean, we can uh, uh, generalize the model uh, um, in a more deeper way into the, uh, like, uh, input output linkages and, uh, and, and these would generate, I mean, these delays would generate some, pro I mean, uh, propagation of the shock uh, uh, across periods. So that uh, would be uh, quantitatively interesting to think about uh, the, the, the length of the shock and how long it's gonna take and, and to think about the recovery as well. Um, here, we really focus on the impact of the shock and we don't, we, are, we don't have a lot to say about the dynamics because it's gonna be, as you will see, like really one time shock. But it would be, but we are thinking about dynamics and I think it would be very interesting and then that would play an important role for sure. And uh, Rajesh Gupta would like to know, can you make the case that we should look at distinction between supply and demand shocks is, or, is, or is your argument that actually distinction is not so important because they're both somehow mixed up and interact with each other? What's the main message on this dimension you want to get across? I think the main message of the dimension, of the, the, of the main message that I want to say is that what is important to focus on is if there is a drop in output in production that is beyond what is efficient. And so that's what is important in the end for policy. We want to understand if we need to do stimulus or not, okay? So it is important to know if stimulus can help the economy to know that. We need to know if there is some room 
for an increase in demand to help the economy going closer to what is the efficient level of production given the shock. Okay. okay. It's so of course not easy to measure, I guess, to figure out in real time whether that it was and if you go below efficiency or not. No, right, right. But I'm gonna, sh I mean, I I'm gonna connect to the data, but uh, it's, uh, um, it's clearly one easy thing to think about the pandemic is that, as I mentioned, the pandemic is a, is a, is a shock that hits some sectors and not other. Yeah. So if you see a drop in consumption uh, uh, in uh, sectors that are not uh, hit directly by the shock, uh, I would think, I would, I mean, of course, I mean, I it, okay. there, may, there are many things going on, but uh, I would say that at the first order, that is a, a lack in demand that, that uh, mm. we should uh, correct. And we can correct. While, I mean, it is important to say that instead, it's not obvious that we want to correct the drop in, the, in, uh, in activity in sectors that have a high contact rate, because it may be actually that uh, there is a health externality that make these uh, activity not efficient. So unemployment in a sector uh, that are hit directly, but that have a high contact rate may be actually good. It depends uh, on the different forces in the model. But unemployment in sectors that do not, that are not affected by the high contact rate, uh, then that I, in, if we don't, if we assume that there are no other important thing going on, that's something that we want to correct. And you would then say the stimulus should be directly on this sector, just subsidizing essentially consumption in sector B. So I'm saying that, and, and I'm going to talk about that later, but the okay. thing is uh, uh, the important thing, it's important to actually ensure the workers of sector A, because those are the workers who could potentially <laughs> spend in sector B, but do not have the income because their sector is directly hit. But what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, and, and so that's imp actually important. I mean, you, you don't want to give uh, 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 transfer to workers that are not affected negatively by the shock. You prefer to target the ones that are hit directly. But for example, if you think about a standard government spending instead of a transfer scheme, you're going to see that the standard government spending is not going to have the standard amplifying uh, multiplier effect in a Keynesian cross because uh, the government spending is not going to increase the number of jobs in sector A because sector A is either locked down or people don't want to work there or people don't consume there, right? So then you are going to miss that standard amplifying thing that, you know, you spend more and then uh, uh, spend more, people get more income and so these create more jobs. It's going to probably generate more jobs, but in sector B and not that's not where we really, uh, I mean, we want to like, you want to do that a little bit, but it's not the, the best way to increase demand in sector B. Great. Thanks a lot. You're welcome. Okay. So <clears throat> if there are no more questions, let me tell you the, the plan. The plan is that I'm going to show you the model. And then, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about policy, what briefly I, I mentioned now, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more about that. And then I'm gonna show you some of the um, facts that have been produced by other researchers and try to link that to our work and then say where, uh, where it is consistent or where it's puzzling and, and what we can do further to, to understand better what's going on. Okay, so let me uh, um, start with the preferences and technology. So uh, we're gonna think about infinitely lived households. There is a continuum of them, of agents and uh, they consume two goods, good A and good B. And uh, there is a standard uh, aggregator function between the two goods. Sigma is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution across periods. And epsilon is the intratemporal elasticity of substitution across goods, across goods produced between in sector A and sector B, okay? The technology is linear, so workers directly produce one-to-one uh, -one. and each agent has a, a labor endowment that is fixed and it equal to n bar okay and the assumption here is that there is a fraction phi of the workers who is specialized in sector a and a fraction one minus phi who is specialized in sector b so labor is immobile in the paper we also handle the case where that we have mobile labor or something in between, but here let me focus with the immobility where labor is immobile because it's, it's going to take time anyway and, and some frictions in that dimension are important. Um, so on the market side, we are going to assume that there is a 
one as one zero, zero net supply asset, uh, one period asset, uh, and then so the budget constraint is relatively standard. There are two goods, so people consuming in good A and good B. People buy assets and then they get their labor income and they return on their assets. Now, can A be positive or negative? If A is negative means that people are borrowing. We are gonna assume that there is a function mu of the agents who are completely constrained, meaning that they cannot borrow at all. Okay? And one minus mu of them, they can borrow or lend that's uh, free. Okay? So we can, uh, uh, with this uh, general framework, we can think about two extreme case that cases that are gonna help us to think about the, the role of the different ingredients in the model. The first thing is that if we let epsilon go to infinity, and so let the two goods to, group to be completely substitute, uh, well, then it's like one sector model, okay? So this is gonna help us, uh, so we can think about epsilon going to infinity to think about what's gonna happen in a one sector model. And then if mu goes to zero, then, uh, so the fraction of the constrained agents becomes smaller and smaller, well, then we'll converge uh, to a mod, to a, a, an allocation that is equivalent to the complete market one, if we think of the aggregate. Okay, so we're gonna use mu to zero to shut down the market in completeness. If you wanna understand the different role of different pieces. And finally, let me say how we think about the pandemic. So the pandemic, <clears throat> The, uh, we are gonna think about the pandemic as an MIT shock in the sense that there was no before, it's an unexpected shock at time zero, and then it's gonna completely disappear at time one, okay? So at time zero, what's gonna happen? There is a temporary shutdown of sector A, and we are gonna model that in a simple way. So these workers were assigned to, to, to sector A, five of them are gonna suddenly get just zero endowment. And then from time one on, we are gonna go back to normal, back to the flexible price allocation, okay? So as you see here, it's really about the impact effect. We are not thinking about the dynamics because that, that's the nature of our exercise. Now, hey, Veronica, yeah. can I just ask, you don't need any, or an ex, a debt contract is enough because it's a zero probability shock. That's exactly. because in your special case, yeah. you don't need any equity contract or any state contingent contract. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's think about uh, uh, the uh, two additional assumptions. One is uh, downward rigid uh, nominal wages. And the second one is uh, we are gonna assume, now because now the question is, uh, how do we ask our question about occasional supply shock? And the way in which we're gonna ask is imagine that there is this shock, okay, at time zero, what happens? Is there excess demand or insufficient demand? And the assumption is gonna be when the central bank keeps the interest rate unchanged at the steady state level one over beta, okay? And, that, and there is downward nominal rigidity. What's gonna to happen to demand, okay? And so the answer is gonna be that if we are gonna answer there is excess demand, well then this is a standard supply shock. If instead the answer is there is insufficient demand, then then, this is actually gonna be a Keynesian supply shock. So uh, let me start with the uh, extreme case that, that I mentioned before of one sector, basically the, the goods completely substitute. In that case, uh, either we complete or, or incomplete man, market, so mu can go to zero and this result stay unchanged. Uh, we, sorry, mu can go to one and these results stay unchanged, then uh, uh, a negative supply shock is gonna generate always excess demand. Okay? Or another way to look at the same question that we analyze in the paper is what's happening to the natural rate. And, uh, uh, and of course, uh, uh, a negative supply shock that generates excess demand would generate an increase in natural rate. What's the intuition for that? Why in a one sector model, there is no hope for, uh, um, for deficient demand? Because basically this is a temporary shock, tem temporary negative supply shock, uh, which means it's good news about uh, your income in the future. And so how you're gonna respond in any model where there is an intertemporal substitution across periods, well, you wanna borrow today that you're hit by the negative shock uh, and, and then uh, uh, repay tomorrow. And so if, even if you have incomplete markets, uh, you, you, you may not be able to do that. So if you have some constrained agents, you may not, they may not be able to borrow 
And at the limit, if everybody's fully constrained and gets zero income, uh, they actually uh, may not respond at all, but they will never save. So their desire is always to borrow. If they cannot do it, they just won't do anything. So at the extreme where mu goes to one, uh, there is gonna be no excess demand, but there is never gonna be deficient demand, okay? So that's a, the, so at the, at the limit, uh, the natural rate is just gonna be unchanged. And, uh, let me show you the same into the, like in a different way the, the intuition for, for this case. So let me show you this picture that I'm gonna use all over in all the version of the mod, different versions of the model to give you the, the mechanism. So on the um, x-axis, we have income, uh, current income, uh, when we assume that from, time, from tomorrow on, the income, go, the, the labor supply goes back to N bar. Okay, so at time, uh, in a time, in normal time, in steady state, current income is an N bar, okay? But at the time of the shock, income is gonna be one minus phi N bar. And then the blue line here is our consumption function, okay? Again, remember, assuming that from tomorrow on, we are gonna go back to a flexible price allocation, okay? And to, to an N bar endowment. And so the question is, uh, when, uh, if today we have a shock, so when, when in normal times, N bar is the level of endowment, and so N bar is the level of demand, okay? This is steady state. What happened when we have the shock? Even if we were at full employment, so income was one minus phi N bar, the consumption function will be unchanged because we said we assume that the central bank keep the interest rate at one over beta. So the level of demand, uh, it's clearly higher than the level of uh, production. So this, is, this gives you excess demand. Now, this is it with complete market. What would happen if you have incomplete market? Why this intuition goes through? Well, because with incomplete market, what's gonna happen? This consumption function may become steeper, may become more concave and steeper, but the, the slope of this consumption function will never be bigger than one. At most, it's one. So you will always have, so at most, it's going to be just the 45 degree line and we will have zero excess demand, but we will never go below that. Okay? So this is uh, uh, the main, uh, um, the first uh, starting point is that with one sector model, there is no Keynesian supply shock. But now we are interested in thinking if there are, there is the possibility of demand shortages in the economy with a, a pandemic. And so we want to bring multiple sectors into the picture. And so what we show is that once we have multiple sectors, so epsilon is not infinite anymore, but is uh, uh, smaller than that. Well, then even we complete market, we can have a Keynesian supply shock. And in particular, we are gonna have a Keynesian supply shock, so we are gonna have deficient demand in response to a, negative to a negative supply shock when sigma is larger than epsilon, okay? This figure here uh, show these, uh, uh, the pink shaded area is the area of the parameter space uh, where Keynesian supply shock are possible. And what's the intuition? Why this is the condition? Why a low epsilon and high sigma helps for the, the case for Keynesian supply shock? Well. A low epsilon helps, remember what low epsilon means, epsilon is the elasticity, the elasticity of substitution across sectors, so, so low epsilon means that the goods are more complement. So when the goods are more complement, as I mentioned before, if a restaurant shut down, you're gonna uh, buy less clothes online. And so this is gonna create more shortage in demand also in the sectors that are not hit. And then uh, uh, sigma, is instead the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. So why high sigma helps? Well, so this is a different way to give the same intuition. Uh, why people really don't wanna spend today? Well, another way to look at that is that there are some goods that are not produced today, but people would love to consume. People would love to go to a restaurant if it was safe to do so. It's just that the goods doesn't exist right now because if, even if the restaurants reopen, it's always scary because you can get infected. 
or you have to go with a mask or I mean things are different so if you think that tomorrow those goods are gonna be back into the picture as long as there is some love of variety and as long as you like to substitute intertemporally you will like to do so that's why demand today is depressed okay and that's why a high sigma helps for the case the case for uh, um, can just... so, Veronica, can I interject another question? Sure. So if I split up your sector B, which is not affected directly from the health concern into two subsectors, one which is, you know, the product is very complementary, comp is a complementary to the sector A product and the other one is not, mm -hmm. would you see a shift, a radical shift in, uh, in the consumption? And is this a way to test your theory in a sense? For sure, that, uh, that would be... <clears throat> A consistent, the consistent data would tell us that sectors that are more complementary to sector A should get uh, uh, um, a drop in consumption, while sectors that are more substitute should see a raise in, uh, could see a raise in income, uh, sorry, in spending. So, and, and, and I mean, anecdotally, that, that is what, uh, what uh, we see. I mean, there are some sectors that, uh, of course, grocery uh, have seen a, an increase in, uh, in spending. And uh, uh, I don't know, I, I saw the, the paper of uh, Chatty on Monday, like mm -hmm. a pool, uh, make, uh, create your own pool uh, in your garden is something that has seen an increase in, in spending because clearly that's uh, um, it's something that substitutes well with going in a vacation, right? But instead, if you look at goods that are more complement, uh, you should see a drop. Now, the second piece that I'm going to give you, which is the incomplete market story, would contribute to have a drop in spending also in those sectors that are uh, complements. But there should be a, a, a differential effect in those types of sectors. And, and another thing, important thing is that you have always to keep in mind, I think it's important, I mean, at least I see that as a, an important ingredient, uh, also input output linkages. So the way in which we think about complementarities, we wanna always think also about the demand for intermediate goods or capital goods that are used in the production of the sectors that are shut down. But that is also an important source of kind of complementarities that is different from the household's preference complementarity. Yeah. Okay, so um, let me show you the uh, graph. Okay. Um, so here we have the same uh, graph as before. We have again income, uh, current income today. The blue line is total consumption. Uh, and uh, the green line is now, remember, we have two sectors. So the green line is a consumption for sectors, for goods produced in sector two. Uh, and this is in steady state. So in steady state, uh, the consumption, so the income is in bar of everybody. And so the consumption in sector two is equal to one minus phi and bar, which is exactly the production because we said one minus phi workers are, are, are associated to sector, produce in sector B, okay? Now, uh, what's happening uh, uh, with the shock? So with the shock, sector one uh, disappears. So uh, what we see now is only consumption in sector two. So we are, what's happening to the consumption function in sector two? Does it shift up or down? Okay, so this is the question. So this was the, the dashed one was the steady state one. In the example I show you here, sigma is smaller than epsilon. And so this is a case where complementarities are uh, small, substitutability is stronger. And so the consumption function shifts up. So even if the income drop, and so you are gonna read consumption more on the left here, still you are gonna have uh, higher level of consumption in sector two and there's going to be an excess demand in sector two overall. However, if sigma is bigger than epsilon, then the consumption function can actually shift down. So you're going to have a reduction in consumption in sector two, not only because you're going to have less income, but also because uh, given income, you're going to consume less of those goods. Okay. Now, what happened when we introduce incomplete markets into the picture. When we have incomplete markets into the picture, uh, the area where a Keynesian supply shock is possible extend to uh, becomes bigger. And you have this additional triangle here that you add to the big triangle that we had before. Okay. And in fact, you can see that the condition for Keynesian supply shock now, it's just sigma bigger than a weighted average of epsilon and one 
which is uh, clearly a looser condition than the one we had before. Okay, so why is that? Why now even, and this is gonna be the case where I'm gonna focus on, even in a on a point in the space where there would be no occasion su supply shock if there was complete market, once we introduce complete mark incomplete market, we can still add a Keynesian supply shock. So let me show you this with the same picture as before. So this is again the case sigma smaller than epsilon. So a case in which with complete market, we don't have hope for a Keynesian supply shock, okay? Now this is before the, sh uh, sorry, this is after the shock uh, and uh, uh, in the complete market case, let's see what happened with incomplete market. Basically, what happens in incomplete market is that you're gonna have a concave consumption function now instead of the linear consumption function we had before, okay? In our model, this uh, concavity is, uh, is kind of uh, extreme, so there is a kink, but uh, this message extends to a more general version of the incomplete market model. And so, but here it's easy to show you the, the, the reason. So what's gonna happen now? So with incomplete market, we said we have a, a sector A that shut down, and, uh, and so there are gonna be the sector A workers who are gonna get zero income. So there's gonna be a mass of workers at zero here. And there is gonna be a mass of workers at N bar here. On average, they're gonna go get one minus phi N bar, but there is a mass here and a mass here. Now let's assume uh, like for the sake of simplicity that mu goes to one, so everybody's constrained. Then what's gonna happen? Well, then the, all the, the agents who get zero income are gonna consume zero, and all the agents who have N bar are gonna consume the level of consumption that would arise in a complete market model, that would, they, meaning they would increase their consumption in good two, okay? Because the goods are relatively good substitute. However, the fact that these guys here have a very high marginal propensity to consume, make them more important. And once we average the, the two masses of, of agents, we are gonna get overall an insufficient demand, okay? So clearly, there is, even if there is maybe a force towards more consumption due to the guys, the workers in sector B, because the goods are relatively good substitute, the lack of income for these guys and their very high marginal propensity to consume may generate shortage in demand in sector B. Okay, so let me uh, briefly um, give you uh, some, our policy, uh, some policy rem remarks. The first one I already mentioned before, the fiscal multiplier on government spending is equal to one in this model. So it's not larger than one as you would typically get in a new Keynesian type of model. And the reason is again that you're not gonna see this second round occasion cross operating because the workers in worker A cannot get, cannot get more jobs because that sector is closed or that people are not gonna consume in that sector. So that sector is not active, okay? How about re remark number two? Remark number two is that uh, now we can have, uh, uh, we can introduce a, a, a health dimension in preferences uh, in a more general version of the model. And we do that in the paper, because once we think about the policy, we wanna think about if actually uh, activity in sector A, as I mentioned before, is actually something that is good or not for, for welfare. And so then we can have a, a horse race between a, an health externality, so epiguvian externality that would tell you that maybe some unemployment in sector A is beneficial with the Keynesian wedge that we have emphasized so far that tells you that actually this is gonna generate this shortage in demand also in the other sectors and so it may be bad. And so then uh, uh, there is, a, um, there is a, a, a careful calculation to make to, to assess what is the best thing to do. Uh, the last remark is that uh, to achieve first best in our simple model, more general, when you think about optimal policy, we need targeted transfers. And why? Well, targeted transfers are gonna uh, obtain three objectives. One, they're gonna provide insurance, which is clearly good in, the, in this model. Uh, two, they're gonna raise natural rate, which is good, especially if you're close to the zero lower bound. And three, it, this may make public health policy more desirable, which is maybe something that we want because of the health externality. Okay, so in this model, this is very um, important. Now, let me connect to the real-time evidence and to the CARES Act that uh, uh, has been in place in the US. So 
I read the evidence as uh, there is a bunch of things I'm going to show you that uh, uh, are consistent uh, with our Keynesian supply shock uh, uh, at work. And the first piece of evidence uh, here comes from uh, a paper by Cox and, and co-authors uh, um, that di they divide the goods uh, in uh, essential, so the blue line is uh, essential goods and uh, essential sectors, uh, and the uh, yellow line is non-essential sectors. And so in a sense, we are thinking these in terms of our model as the essential sectors are the sectors that are still open and sector B and the sector A is the non-essential sector, the sectors that has been locked down, so sector A. And when you look at spending in those two categories, you see that there has been a little spike in uh, non-essential, uh, sorry, in essential sectors at the beginning, uh, right at the onset of the pandemic. But then uh, when the national emergency has been declared, actually there has been uh, a decline in both sectors. So there is a large decline in spending also in those essential sectors that were not hit directly by the lockdown or that they were, they were not high contact intensive. And so this is speaks in favor of our, of our model that the, the, the shock that hit some sector propagate to the other sector in a demand fashion. Another um, uh, figure that show evidence that is consistent with our story is a, from a paper by Brinca Duarte and Faria Castro. Um, is they divide, uh, uh, they, they look uh, at employment in different sectors and they show that there has been a broad contraction in most sectors. And they do also an econometric exercise, in part also inspired by their, their previous paper and by our paper, uh, that uh, try to disentangle how much is demand and how much is supply. And they show that both components are uh, important across the board in all sectors. Another uh, figure uh, that I think is consistent with our evidence that you have seen on Monday from the new paper by Chetty and, and co-author, and um, show that uh, on the x-axis here, we have uh, uh, the rent in different location. And on the y-axis, what uh, they plot is the change in uh, spending for low-income households. And so uh, their story is that is supported by a, a lot of evidence that they have shown on Monday is that in high uh, rent regions, there are more rich people. And so these regions are the uh, regions that uh, um, suffer a highest drop in spending because rich people are the ones that uh, had the biggest drop in spending. And so this, this feedback into the low income families because it created less job and created more unemployment and loss in income for the low income households. And so these generates a drop in their spending as well. Okay, so this is again consistent with our idea that uh, uh, actually a, a, a lack in income can um, generate a drop in spending across the board. So Veronica, can I just refer to this? Um, so there was also a phenomenon that many people, many rich people moved out into the countryside, you know, in New York City, Manhattan, they moved to Hampton and so forth. And that might explain a big chunk of uh, the decline in spending and the poor people living in Manhattan might suffer from that. Uh, because of course, way beyond your paper, but that might be something confounding this. And the second thing, can you say something to this so-called Roomba effect, where you say that people substitute some consumption for some durable consumption goods. So instead of hiring a cleaning person, you know, buy a Roomba who cleans your house at home. So a robot essentially. Uh, I guess it goes also beyond your I mean, I guess these, um, uh, yeah, it's beyond my paper, but uh, let me start from the Roomba part. <laughs> so I think that this, this would actually, uh, I mean, in the moment in which I think there is an important channel that is clearly not in our paper, but is, is going to amplify our, our forces, I believe, which is uh, it's true that uh, um, uh, you're going to have a lot of uh, new technology and new product that are going to substitute uh, products that were were, were were produced in sectors where the workers were attached and so these are typically low income workers and so there has been evidence actually that shows that this process that uh, hit particularly low income people who are the ones that uh, uh, actually are going to um, generate a drop in spending so the, they are the ones that suffer more by lack of insurance or uh, inability to borrow 
So clearly that, that uh, is gonna amplify, amplify our story. Of course, you're gonna see some spike in, in some goods production that are the ones that are substitute, but the incomplete, if the incomplete market story is an important piece of the, of the puzzle, that, that is gonna make it important. So there is an important message that I think that, they, that it would be interesting to learn from the data that uh, I think we are not there yet, which is, uh, in our story, there are these two components. The comp one component is the complementarity across sectors and, and or or substitutability. The other is the incomplete market story part. And, and it would be nice to try to use the data, and I'm gonna try to do a little bit of that, but of course we would need more uh, like uh, work uh, to understand that, uh, to understand how important these two pieces are how quantitatively, which one is most important or, or if both are important or one is more important than the other. And this is important, especially thinking about uh, the recovery, if it's gonna be a whoosh or a V, uh, because I believe if it's uh, just complementarity and, uh, and uh, substitutability, then it's gonna be, the recovery is gonna look more like a V shape. But if instead we think that the incomplete market part is important and the accumulation of debt of poor households is gonna be important, then the scar of the, of the recession may be longer to uh, be healed. And so we may see a more swoosh type of, uh, of recovery. Okay, thanks. So uh, let me show you the last piece of evidence I think is supportive of our, uh, um, of our story and, and, and touch base on what Marco said at the very beginning uh, uh, about uh, prices. Uh, so we CP, the CPI in, uh, have been going down in the last uh, months in a steady way, and uh, and and this is consistent with our story because of what is the CPI is going to measure the the active, uh, the goods that are traded, and our uh, our theory tells us two different uh, um, things about prices. Uh, there are two different ways of looking at inflation. On the one hand, uh, we can look at the inflation as a measure of slack. In that case. Uh, we want to measure the prices of goods that are traded. And so we, our model predicts that if Keynesian supply shock arise, you will see a, a, a slack in demand and so a, a downward pressure on prices as we have seen in the data. The other thing that is interesting is that if you think instead of uh, the inflation as cost of living, so a welfare-based CPI, that should go up, as you mentioned in your introduction, those like uh, uh, goods like going to a, res health, uh, like to a restaurant to have a healthy meal but not get infected that is a good that has infinite uh, shadow price. Um, but of course, this is something that, uh, um, that is not measurable and it is a good that is not uh, right now possible to achieve. Okay, let me show you a, a piece of evidence that is uh, instead a little bit more puzzling uh, uh, and tell you how we reconcile that with our story. So this is also from a paper by Cox and Coulter, and they show uh, actually this credit card spending by industry um, of employment. So in particular, it's interesting to look at government employ employees uh, relatively to the others, and the government employees' uh, spending seems similar to the others. And if you believe that the government employees are the ones that probably are not going to be laid off or uh, fired, then uh, um, uh, our, our study would tell us that we should see a much smaller drop in spending from them. Okay, so um, why do we see instead that then are, uh, they're similar to the others? Well, one important thing to consider is that there has been a lot of policy going on. So there is already a lot of, of insu social insurance in place. So the CARES Act has been pretty effective. So one way of looking at this figure is that the CARES Act has been pretty successful. And the other lessons that we can learn for this reason is, okay, the CARES Act has done exactly what we asked for, social insurance, and it was successful in that. And so it kind of corrected the incomplete market part, but this, we still see a drop in their spending. And so this maybe is the complementarity part that is in action. Okay. Can I jump in here again? So Raj Chet, yep. his main message was uh, last time in the webinar series, that especially the rich cut back on consumption a lot, while the poor didn't. Yeah, uh, this is my, this oh, figure. Okay, so, okay, fair enough. I'll let you talk. Yeah, this is the figure that Chatty showed last time. So yeah. you're right, so that, that, that Chatty showed that, that there's been a, a drop in, a, in a consumption more for the rich than for the poor. So, um, I mean, and, and this is in part because they, 
to start with were consuming more in part is uh, maybe that the type of goods that uh, they were consuming were more social uh, there, there was a larger social dimension and so uh, for sure this is something that is in the data and uh, um, and then one could discuss if you see a drop, uh, uh, um, uh, larger drop uh, uh, in uh, in the rich uh, uh, spending, uh, uh, then is this, uh, I mean, how well this connect with the social insurance story. And, and I mean, I think what is interesting is to see that, I mean, low income people uh, consumption drop anyway. And after the CARES Act, there has been a clear recovery of the income, uh, of the low income uh, uh, spending much more than the higher income uh, people. So this is kind of a sign for me that actually there was an important uh, incomplete market uh, uh, component, even if the share of spending of the rich was still larger. And so there has been a larger drop on rich. Uh, the gap here, the fact that the response to the CARE Act uh, um, was more effective on the spending of the low income people is kind of con for consistent with the story that I think that I corrected the uh, uh, lack of insurance for the low income people that was important uh, for the, the mechanism. Okay, last thing, I think uh, I'm, uh, am I yes, out of time? To. Yeah, so let me show you, um, uh, maybe this as a last thing, I think it's interesting. Uh, I mean, a condition, especially for the more empirical people, I think it's in a, a condition that could directly test uh, our uh, KSA story in, is uh, we can rewrite our, uh, uh, our condition for a Keynesian supply shock in terms of measurable object, and it's a, meaning the weighted uh, is a weighted average of marginal propensity to consume uh, of uh, um, the uh, unconstrained and constrained agents in our model uh, uh, relative uh, and these are objects that we can measure in in the data or people have been measuring the data so far so we can plug number here the object that is a little bit uh, more difficult to measure but i think with all this new data maybe uh, possible to do is to look at the how much the change the consumption in the sector B, in sector not affected by directly by the shock, uh, given the drop in consumption in sector A, conditional on keeping income unchanged. Okay, and so this is a, a condition that tells us that uh, occasional supply shocks would be um, available. So let me conclude with uh, our first uh, slide. So what we want to emphasize is that the Keynesian supply shock and so shortage in demand that calls for social insurance is particularly important. In a, and, and to think about the importance of that, we need a model with multiple sectors and in complete market to think about all the richness of the implication. And it would be nice to understand how the two uh, pieces of the model uh, contribute to the drop uh, in spending and to think more carefully about policy going forward. Thanks a lot, Veronica. Uh, fantastic. So we have a clear picture now what needs to be looked at. I think what I like a lot is uh, that we can zoom in at certain empirical phenomena and empirical variables to explain better. Can I ask you some questions? Um, one is more theoretical. So you emphasize a lot the importance of incumbent markets, but there are two ways to view it. One is the way you model is incumbent markets is a boring constraint after you're in the pandemic and then you have a boring constraint. The other one is that at time zero, I might have a complete market setting that I have an insurance contract essentially when I drop. Um, I can see because of the zero probability shock, it, you know, you only need the boring constraint but it makes the message a little bit more difficult. Would you agree that transfers are essentially the solution in, in a sense? Or can you just explain to the audience uh, these two different forms of incumbent markets? One is a boring limit at time uh, after you hit by the shock and one is ex ante before you hit, you have a nice Eori Brue contract essentially in place, which implies the transfers you would like to implement via policy. Yeah, I mean, my co-authors are here, so I want to give yeah, them also a chance in. to jump in if you want, or yeah. I can take it. I mean, anybody, any takers? No? You, you are the command. You have to tell her. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let you take that one, Beto. Yeah, feel free to take it. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I think that... Uh, um, 
it is clearly, I mean, the different, uh, uh, um, I mean, th these are two important things. I mean, first of all, I mean, people were not uh, insured uh, um, against a shock. And, and the other thing is, uh, are people borrowing constraint and can they uh, borrow now? Uh, I mean, we believe that, uh, I mean, borrowing constraints uh, are, uh, or, uh, are quite important in this story because uh, uh, people were not insured. This was a shock that was a very low probability. And uh, I believe we were all surprised by this, uh, uh, this event. Now going forward, maybe there will be more markets for insure against this type of shock. But I think this was a very low probability event. So I think what is more important here is uh, the inability of people of, uh, of getting, uh, um, of responding to the loss of unemployment. And so that's why I think transfers uh, is they're going to play an important role uh, in the policy well let me just, if i can jump in just to sure. say yeah. uh, you know our just a story of how the paper was written is we initially thought we could get the effects we got just from incomplete markets and this follows a tradition in macro um, that goes way back but now is uh, very in vogue to use more modern versions of, of consumption theory and complete markets and such and the basic point is always you know the consumption is more myopic you have to worry about the distributional impacts and, and, and liquidity and things like that um, so it was more of a surprise that complete market wasn't king when it came to uh, defining our results but you know, it is a still an important, uh, I would say, complementary uh, feature uh, of reality that helps get the case in shock uh, going uh, together with the multiple sectors. But uh, it's not necessary. We can get it without that. But we think it helps and it's realistic. So let me just... Uh... Again, Ask again, so you're saying if we take a simple Ayagari type model with incubate markets, you wouldn't get uh, these results. No, it's really, it has to be a cross-sectional, it has to be an aggregate shock to some extent. It has to be a shock that's across different sectors. Yeah, asymmetric shock. Let me, can I add something a little sure. like related, but not immediately related, which I think it's interesting, which is that uh, something that we don't do it. I mean, the paper is like a really a one period, one period shock, but uh, something that that it's interesting in to distinguish. Why it's also interesting to distinguish between the effect of the complementarities versus the effect of the incomplete markets and borrowing constraints, is because we think that in a uh, slightly more dynamic version of the model, the complementarity is something that the moment you reopen, it just goes away, while the incomplete markets part, if people accumulate debt to kind of survive the, survive the shock, then you're going to have more long lasting effects. So like for the question like of a B-shaped or U-shaped or like swoosh-shaped recovery, uh, uh, kind of establishing whether the drop in consumption we see is mostly due to the complementarities or mostly due to, uh, to, to, to house of balance sheets adjusting, uh, it's, a, it's a crucial question, I guess. Well, let me just I jump in on that. So in, in our work, it matters a lot how long the recession lasts or the pandemic lasts. And then a borrowing constraint might be actually helpful. So if you have no borrowing constraint, people might borrow too much. And then if it accidentally, the pandemic lasts too long, you get in a much worse situation down the road. Uh, I guess in your framework, we would also have a similar outcome if the length of the pandemic were random and had, they would face this additional risk of the length of the pandemic. Is this fair to say? Yeah. Yes. So. And this is pretty standard. Yes. Whenever there's any drop in demand or shock, is there, the longer it lasts, it feeds back on itself and makes things really worse. Uh, so uh, the and literature the using on the zero lower is... bound has isolated that, and it would be yeah. true in our framework as well. Very good. Um, so you looked at the fiscal policy, and you said, oh, the multiply is, is just one. Can you say a little bit about monetary policy as well? Is it how should I think of monetary policy? Is like a relaxation of the borrowing constraint, or how should I view if it's not redistributive, in a sense? Or which way would you in this framework? How would you look at monetary policy measures? 
happy to take this one. Sure. Um, so the, the transmission of monetary policy in the standard model is the standard one through the older equation. Um, but there's some interesting insights that you get from our extensions where we talk about um, you know, labor hoarding or mm -hmm. possibly endogenous business access where then monetary policy has an additional role because it increases the value of, uh, of you know, future matches say between workers and firms. And so you could actually have an additional kick from monetary policy because it incentivizes firms to hold on to their workers longer uh, than, than you have without. So you, you get the standard effect, but you also get the additional effect. Uh, from from our extension. And and let me add also another thing. So um, we also mentioned monetary policy. We have another extension where we have uh, labor hoarding uh, that uh, uh, it's important. And, and in that case, uh, um, expansion monetary policy is gonna also incentivize that. So it's gonna be good for that in that dimension too. Okay. I see. But uh, is it fair to say that your analysis points more to fiscal policy than monetary policy, or is it would I overstretch your reasoning? Then I think social. I say, yeah, go ahead. But no, no, Vader, you, you take it. Sorry, I thought you didn't want to take. No, no, no. I can add just to what I already say. You, yeah. you go first. I just say that what is important, what we believe is very important, is social insurance and and the way to achieve social insurance. Uh, uh, I think requires some fiscal component, uh, uh, in, maybe in, as a complement to monetary policy. But uh, I think that that's an important, uh, important. We 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 make the claim that that's an important piece of the policy. Yeah, the model actually I was going to add has an interesting case where if you do the right fiscal policy, it could be now you don't need to lower interest rates, and you might even need to raise them because you could be in a region where you have a Keynesian supply shock only because of the market incompleteness, um, but you wouldn't if markets had been complete. So this would, um, would explain the subtle fact that then if you do fiscal policy perfectly, you recover the complete market situation. And in that case, you may actually need to raise rates, okay? I'm not claiming this is the, the case in reality, but the point is, it's showing this subtle, uh, I think, interrelation between the two policies. So they're kind of working as complements, but if you do something all the way well in some cases, uh, then you might actually flip what you want to do with the other policy. So if the CARES Act becomes too aggressive, the Fed has to hike interest rates. Exactly. If, uh, Obviously, I don't want to push it yes. Yes, no, I, I, it's so just a possibility to up. highlight. It's a possibility to highlight intuition of the mechanism. I wouldn't want to push it, no. but I think it's, there are these subtle interactions between these policies. But I, I think, think like Vero said, the main point is fiscal policy comes out to be crucial. Monetary policy is still important for the usual reasons, but plus these additional reasons that uh, uh, Ludwig mentioned. And I would highlight because I think Marcus, you were getting at this, it's not just conventional monetary policy, of course. We have a, some tiny comments on this, but you know, as usual, up against the zero lower bound, monetary policy may take the role of providing liquidity as you've done in, in some of your work directly in other ways that are not necessarily the, the standard uh, policy rate. But if I bring this model now to Europe and I say, you know, there's Italy, and I know that two of you are from Italy, and there's another country, and a low interest rate might benefit one country more than the other country. So in this sense, it would also be some insurance across uh, some redistributive monetary policy in a sense. Yeah. Uh, then it would be helpful in a sense. Yeah. yeah. So most questions in the Q&A box were essentially concerning the input output uh, dynamics. So perhaps we can conclude with, uh, this if you want to stretch the model further and you, Veronica, you alluded to it uh, that um, you have more, and, and the idea that, you know, you might have supply chains or whole networks of, of settings, and it might also take some time. Uh, so the time dimension I understand is probably not part of the model, but you can have a rich input output uh, setting in, in your framework. Is this fair to say? Yeah, 
um, let me start and then people can jump in. I mean, the, the important thing is, uh, I mean, the important thing, the thing that we emphasize is uh, there may be different type of uh, input output linkages. Uh, and what people thought at the beginning when we are here, newspaper articles about supply chain was more about thinking about uh, the virus hit China first before the US. So people were thinking uh, uh, there is not going to be intermediate inputs coming from China for the production in uh, sectors in the US. US, this is going to be a bad uh, supply shock for, for the US economy. And, and, and that may uh, will be the case. But what we want to emphasize is, is that another type of supply chain now is uh, the supply chain that goes the other direction. So the sectors that are closing that now becomes a pervasive part or uh, share of the economy uh, that they typically use in intermediate inputs and capital goods, uh, those are going to generate a drop in demand in sectors that would be otherwise still open. And so this is the important uh, type of input output linkages that we think are going to amplify uh, the demand uh, the demand shortages. No, so clearly it's important, I mean, empirically it would be nice to have a, a, a rich structure to understand in which direction the uh, stronger uh, different type of uh, relationship goes. Mm -hmm. To understand how relevant, relevant quantitativity is uh, for the complementarities across sectors. I don't know if you guys want to add. Well, yeah, there was, uh, there was a very nice like Washington Post uh, article very recently that was actually all about like kind of figuring out all how like you have a shock like you have an airlines that don't buy such an intermediates and then the intermediates uh, get, they're produced in a little town in Michigan and then the demand like how does like kind of demand chains instead of like supply chains work and and I think that's a I mean those are very important effects. Very good. So typically we have the tradition, we're running really over, but uh, let's have one more final question. We have the tradition to have some positive point you can make at the end because uh, the COVID crisis is not very positive in many dimensions, but it has its positive angles. If anybody of you has some positive message at the end uh, for the viewers, uh, now is the time. Or some positive implication of the model. Huh? So far, it's pretty neutral. I have to say, there's not so negative in a sense. You just show some mechanism, but I mean, I guess well, a positive thing is that the CARES Act seems to be yeah. a, a been right. a successful policy. So that uh, uh, if we wanna right, so right, I mean, if it creates uh, bipartisan support for reforming uh, automatic stabilizer, that would be a very good achievement. I mean, okay, no. <laughs> great. Thanks a lot to everybody. It was fantastic to have you, Veronica, and all your co-authors. Um, hope to see you soon in the real world. And I um, hope everybody's coming back on Monday when uh, Philip Lane is talking about the ECB's policy, then more focused on monetary policy and less on uh, fiscal policy. But uh, you know, we have now some great insights how a demand shortage might arise from a supply shock. Thanks again. See you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.